Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody wherever you are. I am Ed Langle. I'm Senior Director of Programs at the National World War II Museum. Uh, and I'm also, my PhD happens to be in modern British history. So I was especially excited uh, to have our guest historian here today, Dr. Saul David, who is Professor of Military History at the University of Buckingham and who has written a whole series of wonderful books, which I have enjoyed being a British historian on the Indian mutiny, on the Zulu wars, on Queen Victoria's wars and the growth of empire. A couple of more recent ones I will point out just by uh, their title, All the King's Men, the British Redcoat in the Era of Sword and Musket, which my revolutionary war friends will be sure to enjoy and for my World War I friends, since I crossed the boundary myself as well, 100 Days of Victory, How the Great War Was Fought and Won. But more to the point today, Saul is the author of a new and very exciting book on the Battle of Okinawa, about which he will be presenting today. So welcome, Saul. So glad to have you with us. Thanks so much, Ed. I really appreciate that. It's great to be here. So I'm just going to uh, bring up uh, a little bit of visual aid so we can all uh, see exactly what I'm talking about as I move through the story of Okinawa and what a story it is. It began, of course, just over 75 years ago on the 1st of April 1945, uh, when American troops invaded the 70-mile-long island of Okinawa in the largest amphibious operation of the Pacific War. It was the last great clash of the Second World War and one that would have profound consequences for the modern world. So let's just have a little look at where uh, all the action took place. Uh, here's the first map. and I'll just uh, point out a couple of things for you here. So here's Japan itself, the Jap Japanese mainland. And here is the home island. Uh, sorry, here is the island, sorry, of Okinawa, which is about 400 miles south. So why did they choose Okinawa? What, what's happening? Why, why, what was the decision to actually go there? Well, it's 400 miles south of the home islands, as I say, and the plan is to use it effectively as a floating aircraft carrier. It will be used as a base from which they can bomb the mainland and use it as a supply base and a jumping off point for the invasion of uh, mainland Japan proper. It was the culmination, interestingly enough, of a two-pronged advance across the Pacific and up through the south both in this direction here, as you move up towards the Philippines, and that's really the direction that MacArthur was taking from 1942 onwards. And then the other axis has advanced through the central Pacific, and that was the axis on which the troops, mainly uh, amphibious troops, of course, of Admiral Nimitz were advancing. And they both meet, as you can see, these two arrows finally meet at Okinawa. So this is where the two, the twin strategy finally comes together. Um, in one of the first assault craft to hit the beach at H hour on 8.30 a.m. on the 1st of April, uh, 1945, was 22-year-old Corporal Jim Johnston from Wanata, Nebraska. You'll have to excuse my pronunciation of some of these American locations. Now, as they approached the shore, Johnston thought of the dead Marines he had seen in the water and on the beach at Peleliu when he landed there the previous September and, and I quote, wondered what we would look like to the waves that would come behind us. He approached the pillbox, anticipating the impact of bullets ripping into my body, but there was no fire. The pillbox was empty. So he and his men moved inland, and within an hour, the beachhead was, in his words, several hundred yards deep and growing by the minute. Now here is the map of the actual plan of attack, and you can see this is the, this is the location of the original landings here, the Higushi beach, beaches. And what you can also see in this map, are these L plus 10, L plus 15, L plus 15 up the top there, this is the point at which the American troops hoped to have advanced after a couple of weeks. What they actually did is cross over the whole of the island in just two days. So the advance was unprecedented in its speed, and it certainly took the American commanders by surprise. Um, on the day itself, they got 60,000 men ashore, of an initial uh, invasion force of about 180,000, and they occupied a beachhead that night of 15,000 yards long and in places 5,000 yards deep. As I already said, a day later, they'd crossed the island and they'd cut the island in two. Uh, they would soon hold a slice of Okinawa 15 miles long and from three to 10 wide, including two airfields. 
the American commander and son of a famous Confederate leader, Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner Jr. was elated. We landed practically without opposition, he noted in his diary, and gained more ground than we expected to for three days. The Japs have missed their best opportunity. In truth, uh, the Americans had walked into a virtual trap because the Japanese uh, planners were well aware that their 80,000 soldiers, bolstered by about 20,000 militia um, of Okinawan descent, were outgunned and outnumbered by the much bigger American force. And of course, the Americans had the huge advantage of almost complete air superiority and also support from ships offshore. So what they decided to do is concentrate the bulk of their forces in this sort of area here in the bottom third of the island. And they had spent the last nine months building an incredibly formidable system of defenses. Um, they had constructed several jagged lines of, or turned several jagged lines of ridges and rocky escarpment into formidable nests of caves, interlocking pillboxes and firing positions. They had dug, dug tunnels that were more than 60 miles in length. It was the most astonishing logistical achievement. Now, so what actually happened? Well, as the uh, American troops moved south, they moved in two directions at first. The, the Marines went north and the doggies of the 24th Corps went south. And as they moved south, they gradually came upon the main Japanese defensive system. And this is where it began at Kakasu Ridge here. Um, this first line at Kakasu Hill Mass was boasted an ideal combination of defensive features, including a deep moat, a hole stu studded with natural and man-made positions, and a cluster of thick walled buildings. A four-day assault began on the 9th of April, but it failed to break through these incredibly formidable defensive position. There was then a pause, and Buckner at this point uh, betrays some of his inexperience, I suppose, as a commander. He had never commanded troops in battle before, uh, and his decision at this point, as he'd been trained, is to use artillery to solve the problem. Uh, it was a mistake in the view of his deputy chief of staff, uh, who wrote, the artillery can blast away the camouflage and keep the enemy underground, but cannot take positions. And that delay only serves to increase the total casualties and exhaust the troops. The delay of 10 days gave the Japanese the opportunity to get set, whereas continued pressure might have kept them off balance. So when a second offensive uh, takes place in late April, despite all these preparations, it makes little headway. It's at this point that Buckner has an opportunity. He's urged by his subordinates to try an amphibious landing further south. And I'll just show you roughly where I'm talking about. So if most of the defenses are in this location here. You attack further south, you land further south, possibly here, which is where they're threatened to land even before the actual invasion proper or over here. Um, he's encouraged to do this. He asks his staff to consider it and they reject that advice. Um, the, feeling is that the beaches, when they land down there, will be too difficult to resupply, and there's a danger the troops will fail to break out of their beachhead. In my view, and in, in the view of other historians, it was a missed opportunity, and one that, as we will see, as we know, would have costly consequences. Now, Buckner admitted as much to his wife when he wrote in his, to her in a letter, the Japs here seem to have the strongest position yet encountered in the Pacific, and it will be a slow, tedious grind with flamethrowers explosives placed by hand, and the closest of teamwork to dislodge them without very heavy losses. In early May, Buckner ordered the Marines of the 3rd Amphibious Corps, which had actually uh, earlier than this captured the Matobu Peninsula, but after some very tough fighting up there, he orders them to come south and join with the 24th Corps, the, the army troops of the 24th Corps, in a joint effort to advance further south in this direction. Uh, the first view of the battle zone was a shock to 24-year-old First Lieutenant Bruce Watkins from Connecticut, Man <laughs> sorry, from Manchester, Connecticut, who, who himself was a veteran of the fighting on Peleliu. As we moved up to relieve, relieve the 27th Division, recall Watkins, they passed us in bedraggled lines. They had what we call the thousand-yard stare. Their casualties were everywhere, and as our rifle platoons took over their foxholes, they hastened wordlessly to the rear. There was heavy incoming fire. Mortars and artillery shells were landing all around us, and we started to take casualties. The mournful cry of Corsman was heard once again. <laughs> 
Another marine, I'll just move on to the, so this is the sort of location we're talking now. They've got through the original ridge line here and they're in this sort of position across the island here. Still many, many more defensive positions to get to before they break the Japanese defensive positions uh, between Naha and Shuri. This is the final line of defense here. Another marine likened the terrain to black and white photos of the Western Front during the First World War. Muted earth tones, scant vegetation, pitted and pot ridges from the constant shelling, and in the many shell holes along the muted ground lay the detritus of war in its myriad forms. Empty cases of ammunition, spent shell cases, burned out military vehicles of all types, discarded personal equipment. On the journey in, they had passed rows of army dead covered in ponchos, most of them bootless their buddies having scavenged the best pairs for their own use. Now, it was during this, this uh, phase of the fighting that Private First Class Desmond Doss, a 26-year-old 26 26 Seventh-day Adventist from Lynchburg, Virginia, who had joined up as a medic to avoid the need to kill, won the Medal of Honor by rescuing up to 75 wounded men who had been abandoned by their comrades during a Japanese counterattack along a feature known as the Maida Escarpment, or, or better known to us, of course, as Hacksaw Ridge. Uh, and I'm just gonna show you a quick picture of Hacksaw Ridge. This is Doss himself. This was taken after the action. Uh, and he's looking down the, ri the ridge or the side of the ridge where he lowered all those wounded soldiers. Um, you occasionally see it portrayed as a, as a much steeper escarpment. And the most important thing to remember about this feat of, of incredible bravery is that Doss was on his own up there. Everyone else had abandoned the ridge uh, during a Japanese counterattack. Finding himself alone with the wounded, Doss knew that he had to work fast before the Japanese realized there was no opposition. He used a rope and two bowline knots to lower one casualty down after another. How I was going to get all those men down, I don't know, recalled Doss. I just kept praying, Lord, please help me get one more. With his luck holding, Doss worked feverishly for five straight hours. Finally and incredibly, there were no more casualties left or none he could get to. After I got the last man off, he said, I came down. My clothes were bloody. I'd been soaked to the skin by the blood of the men. A day after his heroics, uh, the remaining Japanese on the ridge were finally killed or entombed in their pillboxes and tunnels and Hacksaw Ridge was in Japanese hands. The astonishing feat, as I'm sure many of you know, or many of you have seen, is portrayed in the recent uh, and excellent Hollywood film, Hacksaw Ridge. Now, here's another feature that may be familiar to some, some people who, who have looked at this battle before, and that's, of course, Sugar Loaf Hill, where some of the most savage fighting of, of the battle took place. It's relatively insignificant, is it? When you look at it, just 300 yards long, 100 feet high, described by one veteran as an ugly hive of coral and volcanic rock. The week-long battle to capture the hill, incredibly, given that it's not that big, cost the 6th Marine Division 2,600 casualties, including three battalion commanders and nine company commanders, and a further 1,200 cases of combat fatigue. With heavy rain adding to the misery soon after the battle, the, the battlefield itself became a hellish sight. Uh, one of the most moving descriptions was provided by Eugene Sledge of the 3 5th Marines who wrote, for several feet around every corpse, maggots crawled about in the muck and then wash, were washed off by the runoff in the rain. There wasn't a tree or bush left. All was open country. Shells had torn up the turf so completely that the ground cover was non-existent. The scene was nothing but mud. Shell fire, flooded craters with their silent, pathetic, rotting occupants, knocked out tanks and Amtraks and discarded equipment. Utter desolation. Determined to defend ok Okinawa to the last, of course, the Japanese, as I think we know, fought with fanatical bravery. The garrison was supported by waves of kamikaze attacks, not just from planes, but also from manned rockets, human torpedoes, and even ships launched in one-way missions. The planes were flown by officers of the special of the Shimpu Tokatai, as it was known, the Divine Wind Special Attack Units, who had pledged to crash their airplanes into enemy ships in an act of self-immolation. Um, you know, very moving testimony I discovered in looking at the kamikaze side of the story. Uh, before one mission, for example, a group of kamikaze 
told bawdy jokes boasting of sexual experiences they didn't actually have. Bathos quickly moved to pathos when they boarded their planes and mumbled farewell to their mothers. Another pilot asked permission to marry his stepsister before his mission. She agreed and they spent a last night together. At the time, she wrote later, I thought it was natural he would die. It would have been shameful for him to go on living. Only after his death, and possibly, we don't know for sure, possibly crashing his plane as the aircraft carrier, the USS Bunker Hill, on the 11th of May, causing fires that killed almost 400 US sailors, did she discover she was pregnant. Uh, and this brings me on to another picture, and this is uh, another kamikaze pilot, Ensign Kiyoshi Ogawa, and he definitely did fly one of the two planes that hit the Bunker Hill. And here's the Bunker Hill itself after those two planes had crashed into it. Um, and as I said, 400 killed and 264 wounded. It's, you know, it's, it's scarcely credible, that sort of level from, from what may have appeared at, at the time to be a relatively minor attack. The USS Bunker Hill did not sink, uh, but you can see so many people lost their lives and the Navy uh, had the really unfortunate distinction of suffering more dead during the Okinawa campaign than it did wounded. And that's an incredibly unusual statistic in warfare. Um, I'll give you the statistics of the kamikaze attacks in a minute, but they included a one-way mission by the battleship Yamato, uh, the world's largest to wreak havoc among the Allied ships off Okinawa with its 18-inch guns before beaching itself on the shore and using its crew as naval infantry. Well, that, of course, was the plan. It didn't actually uh, work. The Yamato was intercepted en route by carrier-borne American planes, uh, torpedo planes. It was bombed and torpedoed and sunk with five of its escort and... Uh, two and a half thousand uh, members of its crew. The Japanese kamikaze attacks were designed to destroy or at least discourage the US Fifth Fleet, drive it away from Okinawa so that the troops on land, the Japanese troops on land that is, could then mop up the American troops that were left. That at least was the plan. Um, that was the thinking in Imperial General Headquarters in Tokyo. It was hopefully optimistic and it did not work. Uh, how many kamikaze attacks were there? 2,000 sorties by plane from various airfields uh, in Japan itself and also further south. Uh, and they managed to sink 36 ships and damage a further 368, which were the heaviest US uh, naval losses of the war. But as I say, ultimately they did not succeed. Left to fight on alone, the Japanese garrison made a desperate last stand. I'm moving through the story a little bit more quickly than I would like, of course, because there's still a bit of ground to cover. Um, a desperate last stand in the southern tip of the island, and this is exactly where they made their last stand. And you can see these final pockets of resistance here uh, towards the 21st and 22nd of June. The official end, I suppose, of the battle was the 22nd of June, uh, when the 10th Army headquarters announced the end of the battle. Uh, and, a day before, and the day before, men of the 6th Marine Division had pretty much done the same by raising the stars and stripes at the southern end of the island um, to show that they had taken the ground. Well, um, the battle itself, the statistics are really scarce, scarcely credible. Uh, just to give you some thoughts on what had happened, 83 days, blood soaked. As the fighting plumbed, in my view, uh, the the depths of savagery unseen anywhere else in the Second World War, apart from possibly the Eastern Front between the Russians and the Germans. Uh, in that same time, the US President, of course, Franklin D. Roosevelt had died. The war in Europe had ended, and more, and this is where the really scary bit comes, more than 250,000 people, a quarter of a million people, lost their lives in or near the island of Okinawa. And here are here is the breakdown, up to 110,000 Japanese and Okinawan defenders. That includes the naval losses. 12,500 American servicemen out of total casualties of more than 70,000, making it by far the bloodiest US battle of the Pacific and one of the costliest in the country's history. And here's the real tragedy, 125,000 Okinawan civilians, a third of the pre-war population who were either caught in the crossfire or believed Japanese propaganda that it was better to commit mass suicide than be raped and murdered by Americans. And here's just one of those many Okinawans to die, Mio Takaisu. She was one of 118 student nurses aged between 15 and 19 who perished in the battle. <laughs> 
there was, of course, um, a pretty grim end game to the story. Uh, just to give you a final reference to some of the more notable casualties, they included, believe it or not, both field commanders. Uh, Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner Jr. died on the 18th of June, literally minutes after this photograph was taken. He was at an observation post of the 8th Regiment of the Marines uh, in the southern part of the island. He wanted to watch the battle. He was hoping to see a, a very strong advance that day, and, and indeed he did see a strong advance that day, but tragically he was hit by fragments from an anti-tank gun uh, and he died of his wounds. The Japanese field commander, Lieutenant General Mitsuru Ushijima, also died in or shortly after the battle. He committed ritual suicide on the 22nd. And Ernie Pyle, one of America's most famous war correspondents, uh, was killed earlier in the battle, as you can see by the caption, April 18, 1945, when he was shot uh, by a sniper on an island just off the coast of Okinawa. But even more than the appalling ferocity of the fighting, it's, uh, it's the far-reaching consequences of the battle, I think, that make it one of the most significant in world history. On the 18th of June, uh, with the resistance in Okinawa all but broken, a really crucial meeting takes place in Washington between Truman, President Truman, uh, and his senior military and political advisors. And at that meeting, the meeting's really held to talk about how can we get Japan to agree to unconditional surrender. And the plan by the military, of course, is to invade Japan. And so we'll just have a quick look at the, uh, at the map here again to get us set. So when they're now in control of Okinawa, and the next stage is to get to Japan proper here. The plan is to launch the first invasion of Kyushu, the southernmost island, in November 1945, and then a second invasion of the, of the main island, Honshu, in March of 1946. Roughly 2 million American and British servicemen are going to be involved in these attacks. Uh, it's a massive undertaking, and there's no question that there are going to be enormous casualties. Uh, one of the things they discuss during this crucial meeting on the 18th of June is the possible number of casualties. And although uh, General Marshall, the U.S. Army Chief of Staff, won't give any definite figures, what he will say is uh, they're going to lose an awful lot of men. And they know this, of course, partly because of the incredibly tough resistance on Okinawa. If it was, if it was bad there, how much worse is it going to be they make the point on Japan proper. So Truman, understandably, at the end of this meeting, uh, well aware of the military's plans and what they will potentially cost, says, is there any other option? Uh, this is not a, uh, you know, this is not, <laughs> this is a serious question. Uh, and you, of course, we all know what's going to happen next. What they didn't know at this stage is whether nuclear weapons will work. So what uh, is, of course, pointed out to him is they have these nuclear weapons, they have the atomic bomb, uh, and it might be worth considering using it. They make no final decision on the 18th of June, apart from to consider the possibility. And in the meantime, the planning for the invasion of Japan proper will go ahead. What happens next, of course, is they test the bomb. Uh, this bomb gets tested in mid-July, by which time Truman has gone to Europe for the Potsdam Conference. And he's in Europe when he gets the good news, as far as he and all the other allies are concerned, uh, certainly as far as Churchill is concerned, that the bomb's actually worked. It's been a great success. And in the words of uh, the report that's uh, given to him, um, from America, the memo that's given to him, we now had the means to ensure the war's speedy conclusion and save thousands of American lives. Churchill's response is, is quite interesting too, and it's worth reading it out. Um, he felt, on hearing the news from Truman, that the nightmare picture of an invasion of Japan, which in his view might, co might have cost a million American and 500,000 British lives, had vanished. And in its place, and I quote, was the vision fair and bright, it seemed, of the end of the whole war in one or two violent shocks. This almost supernatural weapon would give the Japanese, he felt, an excuse which would save their honor and relieve them from the obligation of being killed to the last fighting man. Now, what happens next? Well, soon after, uh, Truman signs the final ultimatum known as the Potsdam Ultimatum, uh, which calls on Japan to agree to unconditional surrender or face, in the words of the ultimatum, prompt and utter destruction. Tokyo ignores the ultimatum and Truman gives the order to drop an atom bomb on Hiroshima, 
Why Hiroshima, you might ask? Well, they've done a, a survey of potential targets and they've decided that it is a, a major military center, uh, in the words of the advice that was given, an army city and a major quartermaster depot. They are well aware, of course, and we can't shy away from it, that there will be civilian casualties, but it's worth pointing out that it was chosen because it was a garrison town. Truman's decision to use the atom bomb is, in my view, directly influenced by the bloodbath on Okinawa. He feared that an invasion with Japan, of Japan would look like, and he, these are his words, not mine, Okinawa from one end of Japan to the other, and that it would cost huge numbers of American lives and also huge numbers of Japanese. My object, wrote Truman at the time, is to save as many American lives as possible, but I also have a human feeling for the women and children of Japan. So we can see the location of Hiroshima here uh, at the end of Honshu. Uh, there's Nagasaki there. The first bomb, as we know, is dropped on Hiroshima on the 6th of August. And that's actually a picture of it exploding, taken by uh, some of the American airmen. I don't think that picture actually was taken from the, the plane that dropped it, the Enola Gay. I think it was taken from one of the reconnaissance aircrafts, but uh, feel free to correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong about that. Um, and of course, when there was no response to that initial bomb being dropped, the second one was dropped three days later. How many died? Well, we know that about 200,000, um, the statistics, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to know for sure how many were killed in the initial explosions and, and certainly after. Uh, estimates vary. Uh, even if we take the higher estimate, it is no more than the total number who were killed on the island of Okinawa in that battle, if we take all the statistics, and certainly many fewer than would have died in Japan if there'd been an invasion. Such a desperate course of action, of course, was no longer necessary. Japan begins the uh, negotiations to, to sue for peace on August 10, and the unconditional surrender is announced by the emperor himself on August 14. Much to the delight and relief, of course, I should say, of uh, most Americans, particularly those who would have been involved in the evasion of Japan. Uh, one in particular, I've quoted him before, Lieutenant Bruce Watkinson, Watkins said, our hopes had been dashed so often that it took several days to absorb the impact of the event. Relief flooded slowly into our veins and we began to dare to think of going home. I just wanna read out two last quotes to finish off uh, this presentation. The first is uh, really by a member of the White House map room, this sort of key information uh, and communication center in the White House. Uh, all the information is coming through there. there. This is a man who knows exactly what was going on. And he's really talking about the predicament that faced Truman and the reason he took, his, took the decision he did. Uh, and he wrote, we were losing tragically large numbers of soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen in the Pacific. We had been through those bitter struggles of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. We knew the ferocity with which the Japanese would defend every square yard of territory that they held. We had seen the effects of the kamikaze raids. We were, we were proceeding with plans for the invasion of Japan in the fall and the casualty estimates which the army and navy were making were heart sickening. Not only would Americans have lost their lives in great number, so would the Japanese. The numbers of lives lost by the dropping of those two bombs was a fraction of that number. That would have been lost had the war proceeded. Truman himself, even in, with the advantage of hindsight, never regretted his decision. He wrote a few years later in 1963, I knew what I was doing. When I stopped the war that would have killed a half million youngsters on both sides if those bombs had not been dropped. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saul, wonderful presentation. We'll wait for you, there we go. So we have a lot of great questions and I have a lot of maybe not so great questions, we'll see. Uh, more of mine pertain toward the latter part of the campaign and particularly the dropping of the bomb. But let me start with some of the questions we've had from the public and we go all the way back to the beginning. We had several questions both from Zoom and from Facebook about the naval aspects of this campaign. Uh, and I'm more or less combining them together about the role of the British Navy uh, 
in this yeah. campaign uh, and mine sweeping activities. And is it true that the British fleet at Okinawa, as Andrew on Facebook asks, was the largest in Britain's naval history? Can you say some more about the British Navy's role, about the mine sweeping activities on March 27th, what role they played in the uh, early stages? Yeah, it's, it, it's really playing two roles. I mean, to answer the first part of your question, or the first part of the question, it was indeed the biggest um, uh, British naval force of the Second World War. And that surprises a lot of people, actually, because it's not a statistic that's that well known. And it's not a part of the campaign that's that well known either. But they had really two jobs. In some ways, you could say they were peripheral to them, apart from the mine sweeping uh, uh, job that they did, as you've already pointed out, before the landings themselves, uh, close to the islands. Their main role was actually taking out a lot of the air bases further south. When I was talking about the various raids on, on Okinawa and the fleet around Okinawa during the, during the campaign itself, um, I was referring to the fact that the planes were coming both from the Japanese mainland, but also from much further south. And, that, and so it was the British Pacific Fleet's job to knock out a lot of those air fleets that were in a group of islands that was to the south of o Okinawa. So that's further down the, uh, the Ryoku chain of islands, um, much closer to Formosa. So in that sense, it was further away from the actual heart of the action, but it certainly didn't escape the, the danger of being part of the Allied naval assets. And in fact, there are a number of, of, of actions against the British Pacific Fleet, particularly its aircraft carriers, uh, as far as the kamikaze attacks are concerned, that I cover in the book. Uh, they don't actually lose any, any aircraft carriers because they're sunk. And one of the reasons they're relatively well protected against kamikaze attacks is because the British aircraft carriers have steel reinforced decks, whereas the American aircraft carriers were all wooden decks. So the American aircraft carriers were much more vulnerable to, to air attack. But it's a very good question. It's absolutely important to point out that the British Pacific Fleet played a significant role, but in some way was not in the heart of the action. And that's probably why in some accounts of the battle, uh, they some, some, sometimes slipped off the radar. Okay. Thank you. And while we're talking about the kamikazes, what, did the, what type of strategies did the Americans use to try to adapt to and counter these new tactics? Yeah, really quite effective, actually. And, and, uh, the, the, and when, I, when I give the statistics of the losses, uh, and I tell you that the vast majority of the, of the warships that were lost were destroyers, it, the reason they were lost is because they effectively set up a very clever screen around the main fleet. So from a point at which they'd taken at the center part of the island, they had created an early warning system that was really being manned effectively by two destroyers. Uh, uh, with radar uh, capacity, and those destroyers were there partly to warn the rest of the fleet, and also partly, and you have to say this, uh, partly as a decoy, and a lot of them paid the price. So the planes that were coming in, particularly coming in from Japan, would have had to have gone over that screen first, and understandably, having spotted the first warships they could see, the Japanese pilots headed straight for them. Uh, and so, although a lot of destroyers were sunk, far fewer capital ships were struck. The Bunker Hill, of course, is one example. There were a number of capital ships uh, struck, but none of them were actually sunk. And part of the reason is the effectiveness of that, of that uh, early warning system. Interesting question here, which I've seen pop up a number of times. The, one of the most tragic characteristics of the latter months of World War II, as you know, is kind of the, the breaking down of boundaries, the breaking down of rules, if you will, that, uh, that, that, standards that that had been understood before the war were no longer understood. The civilians had become targets. Uh, the Japanese are using kamikaze attacks. We were preparing to use uh, nuclear weapons. Why uh, or was any consideration ever given to using poison gas uh, against the Japanese defenders? Uh, and if so, why not? Uh, I, I haven't seen any, any sort of direct evidence that they were seriously considering using it on, on Okinawa itself. Uh, but poison gas was a weapon that the uh, Allies had, as, as you know, Ed, and they were considering using. I mean, the most famous instance, of course, is the loss of those ships that were carrying poison gas in Italy, US ships, that is, in a, in a German air raid. It wasn't a targeted air raid, but, but it showed you, I think that the Allies 
they had the capacity, they were prepared to use it, but they weren't going to use it, is, is my reading of the situation, unless it was in retaliation. So if the Japanese had used poison gas, of course, they would have responded. But I haven't seen any documents that would indicate that they were seriously considering using it on ok Okinawa. They didn't really need to. They had, as I, as I explained in my presentation, a, a, a real um, a big advantage in terms of firepower. Uh, what the Japanese had to counter that was this incredibly effective defensive system on the one hand and on the other hand, a sheer willingness to fight to the end. And I suppose you could say that some of the, uh, the, the more ruthless acts of, of some of the American uh, forces on, on Okinawa were in response to the way the Japanese were fighting. Um, it's, you know, it's awful to have to, you know, look at blame on either side but there's no doubt that the Japanese were prepared to fight to the end they were prepared to apparently surrender and and then still go on trying to kill people who were even tending to the wounded and that and that made I think understandably the American servicemen on Okinawa incredibly hard bitten and they certainly the frontline troops were not prepared to take that many uh, uh, Japanese soldiers prisoner themselves either. Right. And as you know, of course, from from your study of the First World War, poison gas might have a certain shock value initially, but over the medium to longer term, it's relatively easily countered. Uh, and the only real effect is to make life miserable uh, for those who have to serve. Um, a couple of very interesting questions here about the conduct of the, of the land campaign in Okinawa. Uh, one is, how can we reconcile Buckner's understanding that it would be hard, slow yards, presumably therefore he knew artillery was ineffective, with him persisting with the very traditional unsuitable strategy that he used. Yeah, I mean, it's a very good question and it's mystified me. And, and of course, you know, when, when, I, when I, as I implied in the, in, the, in the presentation and I make clear in the book, I think it was a mistake not to try that amphibious landing. We will never know for sure what would have happened if he had landed. It's the problem with, with uh, counterfactuals in history. But I think, uh, given the point you've just made, the artillery was ineffective. They were dug in too deeply, really, for the artillery to be able to winkle it, them out. Buckner himself admits this. You had to actually go in physically and do the job. And can you imagine what that was like for the American servicemen? You know, absolutely appalling. And one statistic I should give, which get, will give a sense of, of how tough the fighting was on Okinawa, was that of that 70,000 or so figure of casualties, a good 20,000 plus, maybe up to 25,000, were battle fatigue, combat, combat fatigue, casualties, you know, shell shock, as we would have said in the First World War. And that gives you a sense of how tough the fighting was. These people just simply couldn't carry on. Uh, should, should Buckner have known better? Yes, he should have known better. I, I, I made the point during my presentation that he was inexperienced. I'm still slightly mystified why he was chosen to lead this campaign. He, his only experience up to that point in the war was leading the, the Alaska command. At, they had tried various operations in the in the Pacific as we know uh, but none that he had directly commanded and this was his first opportunity he was unproven and there were many people certainly marine commanders in particular who were better placed than him but I, I do make the point in the book that there, there was politics partly involved in this they, there was a, a disagreement between the marines and the and the army during the Pacific campaign over, over a clashed a number of times and it was very much felt that this campaign needed to be led by an army general and I suppose he was next in line. Um, would a marine have opted for an amphibious landing? I would suggest almost certainly. And since you've touched on the point that brings up a question of my own, um, from my own work on, on the United States military in the First World War, I would argue that there were multiple points where the US Army and Marines failed to cooperate effectively on the battlefield to the point that lives were lost. Uh, and that, that it, it became almost a, a farce uh, at times. In this campaign in Okinawa, I'd say both from, if you look from the larger view of Buckner's choice, uh, but also on the battlefield, how would you assess the cooperation or lack thereof between the Army and Marines? Well, interestingly enough, I don't think that's a major criticism you can make. I mean, Buckner makes the point himself, I suppose he would say this, that the cooperation was very good. Um, I gave a quote earlier on from, a, from a, his deputy chief of staff, a man called Oliver Smith, who was, of course, a Marine. So they very cleverly made sure that the Army Commander Buckner had two chiefs of staff, one Army and one Marine. 
And Smith was a very experienced uh, operator. He was a very capable um, soldier. And I think Smith's presence there made sure that the cooperation was much better than it probably would have been. The fighting as it moves down the island, the cooperation between the Marines and the army, it's not perfect. It was, it was never going to be perfect, but actually it holds up rather well. And, and if anything, towards the end of the campaign, it's the army troops who are advancing at a, at a faster rate, which is, which is really surprising because most people considered that the Marines were the, were the elite shock troops. And so they were in most cases. But one thing to bear in mind, of course, Ed, I don't need to remind you of this, is that the Marines' main job is to get on an island. To fight on an island in a kind of land attritional, uh, attritional war is not there. That's not what they're designed for. They are shock troops who are designed to land on an island and make a breach. Um, so in, in a sense, it's not surprising that the doggies really were possibly at some stages more effective. The, the Marines argued right to the end, and Smith says this in his in memoirs, which I use very much in the book, that actually if you look at the casualty rates and the number of killed, the Marines were much more effective. But you know, in the in the in in time honored fashion, I suppose he would say that. And who would say that they weren't comparing uh, statistics and performance to see who did better? <laughs> but okay. no, excellent, excellent point. Um, my friend Mark Fastoso has, uh, has also, I think, a very good question. Was there any thought to sealing off the south end of the island and laying siege instead of pressing on with the costly land battle? The Japanese could not resupply or maneuver. They could have been left there until the end of the war. Yeah, it, it was considered actually, um, but only very briefly. I, th I think the really key point to understand about Okinawa is that it was the final staging post, as I explained in my presentation, for the launch of the, uh, of the ultimate attack on, on Japan proper. And it's one thing to leave an island in the middle of the Pacific on its own, but it's quite another to actually be using it as a major base of operations when you've got a hostile force on the same island. It was possible it could have been done, but they certainly didn't want to take that risk. Certainly the Japanese, even in this final redoubt that I pointed out in, in, in my presentation, they had a lot of artillery. They don't have all their artillery, but they had a lot of artillery. And in fact, one of the features of the Battle of Okinawa from the Japanese side is how much heavy artillery they, had it, they actually had on the island, a lot more than in any of their previous campaigns. And, and of course, that itself explains a lot of the casualties the Americans uh, took. It was briefly considered, uh, to, to sum up my answer, but it was never seriously considered. Okay, thank you. Now let's take a couple of more questions about the conduct of the land campaign before we move on to uh, discussing the, uh, the atomic bombs, uh, the lead up to that. Um, one of them, a uh, fairly straightforward question from Ben Ronka, how many miles of underground tunnels and other such were on Okinawa? Do you have statistics? Well I, 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 I did actually mention that, but it may have got lost in, in translation. It's apparently 60 miles, and it's really hard to get your head around that, isn't it, Ed? I mean, yeah. you know, anyone who's traveled to Okinawa and seen the island itself like I have, this, this coral rock is incredibly tough. Actually, in truth be told, it's, it's tough to get through the outer layer. Once you get through that outer layer, that outer crust, it gets a little bit easier to dig through. But even so, we are talking about an incredibly deep network of tunnels that extended apparently up to 60 miles. And the physical effort for doing that, of course, did not just fall on the Japanese servicemen, it fell on the civilians of Okinawa who were working as I alluded to, from the summer of 1944 until the spring of 1945, perfecting these defenses. Okay, great. So um, another question, now you, you spoke, and it's a very important point, the scale of the casualties, just the, the grand quarter of a million uh, dead. One of our um, questioners asks, and I'm, I'm gonna broaden this a little bit myself, Roro says his father was a, a physician at Naha, do you have any information about the medical units in that area uh, was in the Navy and one into Okinawa with the Marines? So given the scale of casualties, I'm going to broaden this both to cover the United States and the Japanese. What type of medical uh, infrastructure was there to handle casualties on both sides? How did it work? But also I wanted to ask you, um, since you touched on um, battle fatigue, um, and on what we would call post-traumatic stress, what used to be called shell shock. I would imagine Okinawa was a, an incredibly intense case study. Uh, the, the volume of 
of those types of casualties must have been overwhelming. Were there any processes for dealing with those? Were there any particular lessons learned from Okinawa? Well, um, to, to start with your first question, I mean, the Japanese uh, medical facilities on Okinawa were relatively, um, uh, they were pretty inadequate. They, they had a lot of uh, medical units behind their front lines. I mean, I mentioned the, the, the girl I, I talked about, the nurse, the fact that they were recruiting schoolgirls basically to man a lot of these medical units will tell you that they didn't have enough of them. First point. Second point is they didn't have enough equipment. They didn't have enough supplies. These ran out very quickly so that halfway through the battle, the Japanese were being operated on without any kind of anesthetic. They, they, they lacked antibiotics. They lacked really basic medical supplies and the suffering among Japanese uh, casualties but also among the civilians was really quite terrible. On the other side of the coin, uh, the American uh, medical provision was very good. They, of course, once they were on the island, uh, their rear areas relatively safe. They were never entirely safe because as I pointed out, the Japanese had heavy artillery. There were also air raids going all, on all the time. But they put in place a really very effective medical provision, not only for the servicemen who were getting wounded, but also for the uh, civilians. The Okinawan civilians who were lucky enough to fall into American hands, which is what, as we know, we've already been discussing, the Japanese were warning them should not happen, were incredibly fortunate because it meant that they were able to take them to what were, I suppose, in effect, um, uh, concentration camps, but, you know, without the kind of German uh, sense of, of the word, where they kept them, fed them, clothed them, and looked after them. Uh, and uh, a lot of Okinawans to this day who remember that period are still very grateful for the way they were treated by uh, the American medical facilities. To address this specific point about combat fatigue, it's quite interesting uh, how they dealt with it. Of course, it was never to be encouraged, and there was always a danger, Ed, as you know, that these things can, you know, can spread like wildfire, and you never quite know the extent to which people are genuinely suffering from it. But there's no question on Okinawa that a lot of people were. They discovered relatively quickly on in the battle that the key thing was not to take them, and this is interesting, to take them too far to the rear. The further they were separated from their units, the worse they got. So they wanted to get off the battlefield, but they didn't want to be completely separated because then they really lost all kinds of connection, all kinds of, I don't know, sense of community. Um, it, it sounds like a contradiction in terms, but it's not because the ones who were kept relatively close to the front line generally recovered after a few days and some of them were able to go back into action. But if you took them away, if you took them too far uh, back, they would never go back into action. Smith's quite interesting. I, I quoted him before, the Marine uh, Deputy Chief of Staff, Oliver Smith. He went to visit some people in the hospital. Um, you can tell reading between the lines, he's not terribly impressed. He's not absolutely sure a lot of them were, were whether they were faking or not. But you certainly didn't get a repeat of, of the pattern behavior where you know, they're literally shaking them and saying, come on, you've got to get back into, into the front line. There was an understanding at this point that some people had reached the end of their tether. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Well, let's move on to discussing the relation of Okinawa to the dropping of the atomic bombs and various aspects of that. And I, I'd at least like to touch on some of the the ideas that come up from time to time of what alternatives there may or may not have been. I recall the, the historian John Ellis arguing pretty strenuously that the uh, destruction of the Japanese merchant fleet, uh, I think it was almost entirely wiped out by this point, yeah. offered a compelling alternative uh, in his view uh, that uh, we simply could have starved out the Japanese. So what do you think of, of that idea? I mean, there are there are a number of counter arguments, and uh, they all need to be addressed in turn. Um, the merchant shipping one doesn't hold a huge amount of water to me because the problem you've got with that sort of policy is it, it's it's time sensitive. It's going to take an awful long time. What's interesting about the uh, the leadership in Japan at this time is that even after the two atomic bombs are dropped, it's still on a knife edge as to whether the hardliners are going to win out against the peace party. Um, to not have had those atomic weapons dropped and to simply have had the Allies holding off, on, off you know, staying offshore, as it were, and, and uh, setting up a blockade of the islands, possibly in the long term, possibly in the long term, it might have worked. But you've got to remember, there's an awful lot of clearing up to do. There were millions of Japanese servicemen still on, on mainland Asia 
up in um, um, Manchuria, but also in Japan, all the way through the, the various occupied territories. Um, the British, interesting enough, a book I'm writing at the moment, I'm talking about the, the fighting or at least the landing of special forces in Malaya. You've got a garrison in Malaya. So there are garrisons all over Southeast Asia. And um, to argue that you, you can literally starve the Japanese into surrender at this stage of the war, I don't, you know, it, it, it was time sensitive. I don't think it was ever a, 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 a legitimate, um, it was ever a serious possibility. So no, I'm not buying that argument. But of course, you know, we're, given that we've taken the ultimate step, Truman's taken the ultimate step, you have to look at the possibilities and question whether they, whether they hold any water or not. And of course, even if that decision had been made, quite aside from the time issue, perhaps the amount of human suffering, the amount of the number of dead might have exceeded not only those who were killed in the atomic bombs, but even in a land invasion. Uh, yeah. If you're talking about starving out an island, it's very easy to say, but uh, the consequences of that uh, could, be, could be tremendous. They could, and just to add a quick point, you're absolutely right, um, Ed, and to, just to add something on top of that, what, what, what you had in Europe at this stage, uh, of course, you've got peace in Europe, but what we certainly didn't have is an end to suffering, and the lack of, of, of food in Central Europe meant that huge numbers of Europeans were going to suffer for months to come, and so that really illustrates the point you were making. If, if they're going to starve Japan to the point at which there's literally no food on the island. You can't suddenly reverse that once they surrender and say, we're, we're suddenly going to resupply. These, these things take time and the suffering would have been enormous. Uh, absolutely right. And on, on the time issue, the, um, it's often forgotten that just at this time, the Soviets commence their invasion of Manchuria. And this in, is a case of, for the Americans, be careful what you ask for, you just might get it, because FDR had been trying to convince Stalin to launch the invasion of Asia for quite some time. Uh, and now FDR is gone, of course, Truman's on the spot. He has to deal with the prospect of the longer we wait, the more the Soviets are going to extend their influence throughout, uh, throughout mainland Asia. Was that a consideration in Truman's deliberations on this? It's, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? And it's very tricky. It's a very tricky argument because on the one hand, they were desperate, as you've pointed out, and had been for a long time to encourage the Russians to come in uh, to the war on the Far East. And then all of a sudden, there's the, there's the threat that they're actually making too much ground. Exactly the same problem they had in Europe, of course. Um, so, but did they drop the bombs to prevent any further Japanese, uh, sorry, Russian advances? No, absolutely not. They, they dropped the bombs to stop the need for an invasion of Japan proper as they saw it. And the Russians were gonna play no part in that, although they probably would have liked to have been involved. And in fact, I think there were, dis there were discussions that they would be involved, but, but the allies have very definitely said, absolutely not, this is going to be a, a British American led operation. What do you think of, and you touched upon it, the Potsdam Declaration, um, issuing the ultimatum to the Japanese or face prompt and utter destruction. Of course, the, the, the Japanese ignored it, broadly speaking, but Japanese propaganda also edited it down uh, yeah. to make it sound more awful and draconian than it actually was uh, in terms of what, what po Truman was saying would happen after the Japanese surrendered. Uh, did the Potsdam Declaration backfire? Did it serve any purpose? Could it have been handled differently? I think the Potsdam Declaration really, you know, if we're going to be brutally honest about this, was a fig leaf of legality for what they were actually determined to do, which is to drop those bombs if they didn't agree to unconditional surrender. So the threat, as it were, is sort of irrelevant because the mindset of the Japanese at that time was, we don't think it's over. It's not over till it's over. And by that, I mean, all the, all the indications from the top level of Japanese thinking, and we know this because a lot of them were questioned after the war, was along the lines of, we just need one more crushing blow against the Allies, particularly the Americans, and we are going to get the sort of negotiated peace that's going to allow us to leave this war with, with some kind of honor intact. And maybe some of the, even some of our possessions intact. Um, I think there was an understanding by this point, because of course there were channels open um, among the Allies that that was the case, and that's uh, 
they, they can issue a threat, but it's not going to be listened to. And the fact that it wasn't listened to, I, I just think is, is sums up the attitude among the high level of thinking in Japan at that time. The emperor, of course, interestingly enough, comes quite well out of the end of the story, but only the very end of the story. Um, he does play a crucial role in persuading the waverers, uh, I suppose you could say, and not just the waverers in the government, but also more importantly, the, armed, the, the ordinary soldiers themselves to finally uh, give in. If they hadn't got him on side, uh, it would have been much more difficult to have got a kind of, what was really interesting enough, an incredibly uh, ordered pacification of Japan. Given such a warrior nation, you would have thought it was going to be very tricky. And certainly a lot of the Americans who landed were expecting a lot of trouble by renegades and they didn't get it. So uh, getting the emperor on side was, was a very good thing. The long-term consequences of that, um, uh, we can debate long and hard. But in my view, it has uh, meant it's been more difficult for the Japanese to acknowledge really their war guilt because the emperor was never toppled. Um, in some senses, the final, the, the, the end of the war was never as final and, and, as, and as brutal, ruthless, whatever you want to call it, as it should have been uh, given, given the way that the Japanese have behaved in their empire, in their expanding empire, because of the political need to keep the emperor. Um, but you know, that's a controversial view possibly, uh, but there it is. I'm all in favor of courting some controversy here. That's uh, that's a good thing. I think we have time for a couple of more questions from, and I apologize to all of you who've asked wonderful questions. There's been great participation on this webinar, and uh, I just wish we had another hour uh, to get to get to all of these. Uh, I'll just mention a comment, which I think is a, an interesting one from uh, Rob Eisenberg. He says, "I'm a docent at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum." Some years ago, we had a museum guest who was a Japanese pilot from World War II. When viewing the Enola Gay, he stated that this plane saved his life. An interesting perspective. You know, we look at it from our point of view of the our lives that were saved on the Allied side, but uh, lives were saved on the other side as well. Wow. I mean, I just, just I mean, just a quick, a quick, a quick comment on that. It, you know, I, I'm really struck by that actually because. There were still people in Japan at that time, including the guy in charge of the whole kamikaze operation, who even after the surrender, even after the emperor had said, you know, lay down your weapons, then flew on one last kamikaze mission and lost his life. That was a lieutenant general. So you can see on the one hand, there were still fanatics, uh, particularly at the senior levels of the Japanese military. But on the other hand, nice to hear that story. It did save uh, an awful lot of Japanese lives, Japanese servicemen and Japanese civilians. And we should never forget that. We're, you know, we don't like to deal in, in cold, hard statistics all the time because it sounds quite brutal. But the fact is, a lot of Japanese are alive today or are descendants of people who live because those bombs were dropped. Again, excellent point. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for that one. And I'll end with, uh, with this one. And then as you saw, if you have any final comments, from Kevin, he asks, is there any documentation that supports the claim that Japan did not unconditionally surrender to the US because of the atomic bombs, but instead a fear of a Russian invasion and occupation? No, there, there's, there's no evidence of that. Of course, they weren't happy with what was going on in Manchuria and the Russians were making, uh, were making ground there. Interesting enough, that major advance in Manchuria was actually taking place during all of the events that we're talking about, this end game here. Um, but no, there's absolutely no evidence that that, that was the case. It is uh, well documented. Uh, I already pointed out that a lot of the senior military figures who did not commit suicide, um, senior military and civilian figures who did not commit suicide, were spoken to and debriefed by Americans after the war. There's a wonderful collection of what they said, if anyone would like to see it. Um, and uh, it's quite clear that the shock of those two bombs made all the difference, particularly to the emperor, actually. Um, so no, it wasn't fear of the Russians. As I've already pointed out, the end game of, of the invasion was never going to involve the Russians anyway. Japanese yeah. were concerned with what was going on in Manchuria, but they were not immediately concerned about a, a, a Russian invasion. Right. And then a, a final comment from Linda. I thought it was also nice to what we said earlier. She says, there's also my mother's story of her town villagers near Tokyo who were just happy that the war was over. So, Yeah, so again, really nice to hear. Any final comments from you? What's been a wonderful presentation? Well, thank you, Ed. And obviously, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, taking part. I'd like to thank you, uh, Chrissy and Kate, for making it possible on the technical side. I know they've done a wonderful job. 
brilliant questions today. And I just want to leave with one last thought, actually, on what is, I know, for some people, quite a difficult subject. It was a difficult subject for me to research and write this book. But one thing I am left with is, an, you know, and, and not just on American servicemen, but servicemen on both sides, the, the courage, the endurance, the, 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 the sacrifice. But I have to say, particularly among the Allied side, the, the sacrifice that they put in for our generation was really immense. And if anything gives me, you know, positive feelings about this battle, it's seeing what those men went through and what they were prepared to go through for our benefit. All right, Saul, so you lived up to expectations. So again, thank you so much for all of you who are attending. If you look on the chat feature, you'll see uh, Saul's website, sauldavid.co.uk, his Twitter feed at sauldavid66, uh, as well as his, the link to his biography at the University of Buckingham. Again, Saul David, thank you very much. Yes, Ed.